أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقترب للناس حسابهم وهم في غفلة معرضون ما يأتيهم من ذكر من ربهم محدث إلا استمعوه وهم يلعبون لاهية قلوبهم وأسر النجوى الذين ظلموا هل هذا إلا بشر مثلكم أفتأتون السحر وأنتم تبصرون قال ربي يعلم القول في السماء والأرض وهو السميع العليم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله we begin the 17th juz today and the 17th juz 17th part is made up of uh, two, two surahs and literally half a juz each so the first surah the first chapter is Surah Al-Anbiya, Iqtaraba Lil-Nasi Hisabuhum, that completes at half the chapter, and the second half of the chapter is taken up by Surah Al-Hajj, which also ends with the ending of the chapter. So inshallah, we'll be looking at these two surahs, they're very rich with content, so I'm hoping Allah gives us barakah of time so we can sufficiently, inshallah, cover the two. So Surah Al-Anbiya, to start with that, it's the 21st chapter uh, of the Quran and that's the 17th Jews begins with it it is about 112 verses it contains so it's still one of the hundreds and there's seven sections that you can split it up into uh, major sections why is it called Surah Al-Anbiya we've had Surah Nuh we've got Surah Nuh, Surah Hud, Surah Yusuf this one is called Anbiya the prophets, plural of Nabi, Anbiya. And the reason why it's called Surah Al-Anbiya, it could have been called Surah Ibrahim, but we've already got another Surah, Surah Ibrahim, because it's got quite a prominent story of, Surah, uh, of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and there's uh, several other themes in there. It's called Anbiya because there are about 17 prophets which are mentioned all together uh, in this Surah. Uh, there's a hadith of uh, Sahih al-Bukhari in which Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu relates that uh, the few surahs that we've just covered, the Bani Israel, Surah Al-Isra, then Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Maryam, Surah Al-Anbiya, they're some of the earliest surahs, they, they are some of the earliest surahs to be, uh, to be revealed. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned several things about them. The most important Themes that this surah contains are the following. Uh, we'll have to go through that. Number one, it speaks about. It starts off with "Iqtaraba lil nasi hisabuhum wahum fi ghaflatim mu'ridun." People's reckoning has come close. The time for reckoning has come very close, but they're still completely ignoring all of that. They're in their heedlessness. They're negligent. They're caught up by so many other things. And Allah says, مَا يَأْتِيهِم مِّن ذِكْرٍ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ Any new dhikr and reminder that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they may listen to it, but then they're just playing around. Their hearts are totally distracted. لَا هِيَةً قُلُوبُهُمْ May Allah not make us of these. لَا هِيَةً قُلُوبُهُمْ وَأَسَرُ النَّجْوَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا هَلْ هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Then it goes on to discuss about the disbelievers. So, Qiyamah, Hisab, obviously refers to Qiyamah. There are several stages of the hereafter. There's obviously the day, there's obviously Qiyamah, the ending of this world. Then obviously there's the time when there's nothing left. Then there'll be the Ba'ath, which will be the resurrection. Then there'll be the Nashr. And then that will be this, the, 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 the driving. Uh, there, there'll be then the Hashr, which basically means that will be when everybody will be gathered in the plain of Mahshar. Then the Yawmul Hisab, 
the, then it will become hisab. So these are all different stages of that journey of the hereafter, which we ask Allah to facilitate and make easy for us and make successful for us. So these people, they don't, they're not preparing for the hereafter. They're not preparing deeds, which they're, they're doing deeds, but they're not doing deeds which are to be of benefit in the hereafter. In fact, more so what they do is when a new verse is revealed, they play around, they mock it, they, they, they make jokes about it, and they deny it, of course. They don't understand what kind of awesome and honorable speech this is, which holds so much for their success, but they just don't understand that. Now, the other thing that these mushrikeen would do, this is uh, directly discussing the mushrikeen and their response to the Qur'an, because remember, this is the Qur'an that we're discussing. So, a few things they would say. They would basically say, firstly, that all of this claim that you have to, as being the messenger, he's not really a prophet. He's just like an insan and a human being, just like everybody else. And look, he can't provide the same kind of uh, miracles like the previous prophets used to provide. Like, you know, they may have heard about the staff of Musa alayhi salam and so on and so forth. These kind of, what is this Quran? You know, give us some physical miracles. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ had enough physical miracles, but remember, these were all excuses anyway. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to that um, by saying that every single prophet that came before they were all human beings as well. Nobody was an angel. They were all human beings. And they all had human, they all had human traits. There was nobody that wasn't a human being. They were all human beings, just like the Prophet ﷺ. And in terms of the mu'jizat, I mean, how can there be a bigger, bigger mu'jizah and a bigger miracle than the Qur'an? There is not, nothing bigger. So let's just look at this quickly before I explain that to you. They say, أَدْغَاثُ أَحْلَامْ بَلْ إِفْتَرَاهُ بَلْ هُوَ شَاعِرُ Anyway, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا So in verse 7 he's saying, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا We only sent before you men who we used to reveal the message upon. If you don't believe us, then فَسَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُ If you don't know, go and ask the people of knowledge. They were all men. There was no angels. وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُلُونَ الطُعَامِ If you look at the next verse 8. And we didn't make them into certain bodies that didn't have to eat, for example. And they were not here to remain forever. وَمَا كَانُوا خَالِدِينَ But whatever we did promise through them, we fulfilled that promise. So we saved them and whoever else we wanted. And then all those who were doing excess, we, we destroyed them. So لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا this is the, the verse that I'm going to explain now. Verse 10. We have revealed upon you or to you a book in which there is your mention. Or we've revealed a book which discusses you. Don't you then think and comprehend that? What exactly is happening here? So the idea is that in terms of the mu'jizah, the Quran is the greatest mu'jizah because it's the living miracle. When the water gushed out the Prophet ﷺ fingers, and when the food was enough for an army, or just one pot of food was enough for a whole army, that was something very time-specific. It's very difficult for us to see that and observe that. But the Qur'an is something that continues, and this ayah is actually clarifying that point. So what, is, what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, one of the ways of the inimitability and the challenging nature of the Qur'an, the unique nature of the Qur'an, miracle nature of the Qur'an is that essentially the Qur'an is something that it's like a mirror for everybody. Anybody who opens their heart and reads the Qur'an, they will basically understand where they are in terms of their beliefs, in terms of their ideas about life, their concepts of various things about the world, their akhlaq, their character, and their a'mal and their deeds. You will basically be able to check what kind of, uh, where we stand in terms of these things. And you can basically see one's face in terms of that. Because pr pretty much the Qur'an caters for everybody. It speaks about everybody. It describes everybody. Your, our profile is going to be in the Qur'an. If you look at it, you will find your profile in the Qur'an. Okay, that matches what I'm doing. That doesn't. This matches me. This is me. This is me. And this is what's going to happen to me. So not only does it match the profile, but it also talks about the consequence and what you get for that profile. 
It's an amazing, it's uh, better than a crys you know, the crystal ball or you know, all of these, whatever that people look into. This is what you should be looking into. Everybody's mentioned in here. Either directly, explicitly, or indirectly, or implicitly, there's going to be a discussion. And I would suggest that you just read one juice of the Quran, half a juice of the Quran, you'll, you'll be able to find ourselves in there. That would be an exercise that we do after this class sometime. So, for example, there was a famous tabi'i, he became a tabi'i, uh, that, that means a companion of the Sahaba, right? And he was actually one of the leaders of the Arab of his time. His name was Ahnaf ibn Qais, rahimahullah. One day he was just sitting down and somebody recited this verse. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ So he, that's when it struck him. Remember this Quran strikes you at different times. And he said, bring, bring a mushaf. And he says, let me look for my profile inside. Who am I with? Right. And who do I resemble most from what the Quran speaks about? So as he's moving, as he's reading and he's moving the pages along and he comes across the verses regarding the people who are the fortunate ones, the Ahlu Sa'ada, right? Basically people who've sacrificed themselves and uh, many aspects of theirs, many, uh, many of their uh, assets and so on in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they've spent in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, they've basically stayed up the night keeping their sides away from their bedding. Uh, they wouldn't even go close to, to the wrong. Then after that he started reading the other category of people who are the mushrikeen, the idolaters, the disbelievers, the hypocrites, the, the transgressors, the sinners and so on. So after he looks at all of that, he thinks that, you know what, I, he ca carries on reading with this and he sees all of that discussion. He says that, Ya Allah, I'm not finding myself in any of these two groups. I'm neither with the full righteous and neither with the full sinful and disbelieving. So he carries on reading and he gets to Surah At-Tawbah, right, which is Bara'a as we read. And there the discussion is about those people who've done some good deeds, who are do doing good deeds, but they've also done some bad deeds. So when he reads that, that's when he says that this is my discussion, this is my profile, right? This is what's speaking about me. So eventually everybody will find their discussion as to who it is and then the Quran provides responses, it provides engaging ideas, it engages with the reader. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, allow us to benefit from the Quran in the same way. Now one of the ways the mushrikeen used to respond to it is they used to do it in some really really crazy ways, really insane ways, you know, literally foolish ways, that just laughable ways. One of that is that they would say different, they would basically say different things about the Qur'an. They, they never had one opinion that the Qur'an is this. They would just fling mud as, and see if some of it sticks. So for example, sometimes they would say that this is magic. Sometimes they would say it's poetry. Sometimes they would say that this is adghathu ahlam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relates here. Bal qalu adghathu ahlam. Right, they're just stray thoughts of the day. Right, just crazy thoughts of somebody's mind. Sometimes they would say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa actually just fabricated it, made it up, iftarahu. Sometimes they would say that he learned it from somebody else. Right, he went to somebody and studied it. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, Allah relates all of that here, that فَلْيَأْتِنَا بِآيَةٍ كَمَا قَالُوا أَدْغَاتُ أَحْلَامٍ بَلْ افْتَرَاهُ بَلْ هُوَ شَاعِرٍ Ayat number five. فَلْيَأْتِنَا بِآيَةٍ كَمَا أُرْسِلِ الْأَوَلْنُ So that's why he should bring us signs just like the earlier prophets. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds by talking about the, all the next verses you will see. They're all to do with what happened to the people of the past and how they were destroyed when they didn't listen. فَلَمَّا أَحَسُّوا بَأْسَنَا إِذَا هُمْ مِنْهَا يَرْقُدُونَ لَا تَرْقُ وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ كَانَتْ ظَالِمَةً وَأَنْشَأْنَا بَعْدَهَا قَوْمًا آخَرِينَ 11 Verse 11 How many, how many we've uprooted? How many areas? How many people? How many localities? So the, when they فَلَمَّا أَحَسُّوا بَأْسَنَا As in verse number 12 It says that when they 
felt that our punishment was coming, they tried to then retract. But they, they couldn't. They couldn't run away. They couldn't run away. So then they said, Ya waylana inna kunna zalimin. Woe be, woe, be to, woe be upon us. We were oppressors. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues the discussion. There's lots of discussion then about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Numerous dalail are mentioned, numerous, uh, numerous evidences are mentioned, numerous points are mentioned. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, it's quite uh, interesting uh, verses to read. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the ground, He speaks about the earth, He speaks about the heavens, the sun, the moon, uh, He speaks about the day, the night, and basically just really easy concepts that are in your face that you see, but you don't really think because you take them for granted. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly, like for example, Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَاسِيَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِهِمْ Okay, I'm going to discuss that. يَعْنَوْ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Allah talks about how He knows about everybody. Then, in verse, if you look at verses 16 to 20, right, that's where you'll see all of this discussion about uh, the heavens, the earth, and all, all, all the rest of it, all of these evidences basically, then when you move on to... Uh, verses 21 to 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, speaks about how they would bow down, how, how they're basically worshipping idols that can't do anything for them. So all of that discussion is in there. Essentially what you see is that every evidence that they provide, or every idea or response that they provide, none of it is rational. They have them, some of the weirdest ideas of why they worship. Like bring your evidence. You see in verse 24, for example. But none of them are any, any rational arguments that they could bring. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is that to respond to them in a way that they hopefully can understand with clear evidences, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings six evidences regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's being the creator and regarding him being able to do everything. All of these evidences are from the cosmic realm. They're all from observable realms outside that you can completely see. So for example, if you look at verse number 30 now, and you can follow this with me, you look at number, uh, verse number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ These are two evidences. The first one is, don't they, the people who disbelieve, don't they see that the heavens and the earth, I mean there's various ways of translating this, we look at translations, that it was closed. And then we, we, uh, we, we let it open up, so now the rain etc. can come. Right? That's one opinion. Another opinion is that we notice that the earth and heavens were together in one mass. And then we separated them. The Big Bang Theory seems to support this idea, or it goes in accordance to this idea that all the mass was together and then after they split up into all of these different things. So lots of people have discussed that from an astronomical point of view and from the inception of the world idea. Lots of discussion. But this is something that the Quran said 1400 years ago, like making that claim when nobody could have ever even thought about these things, going back that far. Because talking about the Big Bang and all of these kind of things is just relatively last few hundred years that they've been speaking about that. Otherwise, before that, you know, there, were, there was nothing that you, because you just didn't have that ability to go even that far. Right? We still have got a long way to go. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this very clear. And as the days go by, this will become even clearer. The second point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, discusses is, uh, we, and this is 1400 years ago, Allah said this, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ Every living being we've created from water. And now we know, I don't know what is 80 something percent that the human being is water, likewise all other mammals and everything, and everything else. And if you remember the hadith which mentioned that there was nothing except Allah's throne. <coughs> there was nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne. And that was on top of water. And that was on top of air. So water is basically the life-giving uh, uh, factor or substance for everything. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions now. Anybody who thinks about just these things, like, you know, 1400 years ago, coming from a person who had not read, 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 uh, read uh, who had not gone to university, not said you have to read or write, had not really taken any other courses like that, and he's saying things of this which are of so much depth and profundity. 
So that's the second one. The third point, I mean, all of these are to be opened up, believe me, from in their respective sciences. You can study all of these things in great depth. I'm just trying to rush through them. The third one is in the next verse, which is uh, 31. This is, in this one, he's talking about mountains and the purpose of mountains. The reason we've got mountains pegged in different places is because we've got continents. Now, because of various different movements, we could have a lot more earthquakes. Mountains are what basically helps to, cre uh, to create stability so that there's not as much movement, otherwise we'd be shattered. That's one thing. The other thing is that it's also there to keep it such that because the earth is breathing and it's got in its core, it's got this molten lava, which is just, you know, prepared to s spew out. So if it wasn't for this, then we would constantly have more earthquakes, we'd have a lot more lava flows and we'd have a lot more problem in the world. Now we still have that sometimes because the world does what it wants to do in that sense but the mountains are what creates the balance in there. <coughs> of course the way the mountains are made is because of them contracting together, coming together and then the upheavals and so on. That's a whole discussion you can look at. Number four is then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the mountains. That you've got sometimes mountain ranges, but there's always a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides you to get through them and traverse the mountains through its ravines and through its mountain passes and through the valleys and so on. So they're not like just one huge block, right, for miles and miles and miles and miles of end that's just useless. There's a lot of places where you know you can get through, and and uh, people have basically either tunneled through them or, or or made things through them. Allah has made that possible. Number five then is a discussion about the heavens, how it's. We've we've made it a protective roof, a protective ceiling almost, a protective uh, uh, protection basically above our heads with everything that's in it. You know, with everything that's in it, it's got the huge amount of stars in it. I mean, from our perspective, that's a roof for us, right? Obviously, when you look at it from another star's perspective, then everything else is similar. But for us, all of this is part of the decoration of the night and that ceiling or that roof that we look at, in which is the sun, the moon, and everything else. And the, what's interesting, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention there, is... As, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمْرِ He created the night, the day, sun and the moon. كُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ All of these planets, they're all going in their own orbits. Now that is something amazing, that we are in our orbit, we're moving around the, uh, around the sun, and we see these other, pro, uh, other, other planets as well. But all of these planets have their own orbit, even the sun has its own. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making some very bold statements here. You know, from a human perspective, Allah obviously knows everything. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, you know, basically the question with all of this is that who's going to look after this? Who, where does all of this come from? Can they expect that all of this is being powered by and controlled by the Lat and Manat and Uzza and all of these idols that they had? Or is this from the great Lord, the great creator, who they used to actually believe in, but their focus was on these small things? The sixth one then is more about, uh, which we just read, which is about the night, day, the sun and the moon and so on. And saying, uh, what the very interesting idea, the wording which is used for every one of the planets, these celestial bodies, that they're all swimming around. And literally that's what it seems like they're swimming around in an ocean of space. Right? That's a very interesting concept, especially for astronomers. Now remember, for us, a lot of these things through astronomy, the modern day understanding of this becomes much more clearer. When the Quran mentioned this originally, a lot of this understanding, yeah, they had rudimentary understanding of astronomy of some sort, but not to the level of telescopes and so on that we have. Whereas all of these things are becoming much more clearer. But these were all done at a time when absolutely had hardly any information about these things. How can somebody who is a ummi, not gone to university, no degrees, have all of this information? That's why eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse 37, ajal. The human has been created uh, you know, from haste, with a hasty character, hasty disposition. Uh, I will soon show you all of my signs. I'll show you my signs. Just don't rush me. You'll see all of these things becoming clearer and clearer as we go on. Anyway, then it carries on. There's a lot of discussion about tawheed, nubuwa. Uh, resurrection, coming back after life, the, 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 the reckoning and, and so on. All of that is mentioned, and then after that from verse, uh, why is it called Suratul Anbiya? 
Well, finally from verse 51 is where the second half of this surah is all about the prophets. It starts off with the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam that uh, where he starts off as a young boy and then he sees he just can't reconcile how you can worship these idols who don't do anything to you. So what he does is he says, I'm going to wait and I'm going to do something about this. He waits when the people have all gone out for some celebration or whatever it was and he goes and he breaks the idols and keeps the big one, puts the axe or whatever the tool he used in the hands of the big one. When they all come back and they're like worried, what happened to our gods? Somebody mentioned that, oh, there's a guy called Ibrahim who keeps mentioning them. Bring him along. Did you do this to our idols? He said, look, بل فعله, uh, بل He did it. كبيرهم هذا فاسألهم. This is the big one here. Ask him. This was his ploy of making them think. So they're like, فَرَجَعُوا إِلَانْ فَقَالُوا إِنَّكُمْ أَنْتُمْ الظَّالِمُونَ uh, 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 Ask them if they're to speak. Obviously, they had to look down then, right? Because they know they don't speak. That's when it dawned on them. But they, they said, we're going to punish you for this. So they made that big fire and they threw him in there. But Allah says, يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمٍ Become cool. Right, become cool and become a place of become a place of safety and security and goodness for Ibrahim. And he says those were some of the best days of his life, he said, when he was in there. SubhanAllah. Right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses uh, Nuh alayhi salam, sorry, Lut alayhi salam, his his nephew first, and 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 uh, the issues he had with them, uh, with, with his people. Then, uh, then the discussion is about Nuh Ali Salam, who must have propagated for 950 years, one of the longest propagations. Then the discussion from verse 80, uh, 78, etc., is Dawud and Sulaiman Ali Salam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had given them both prophecy, and they were also rulers. They were the rulers of their time. They were the kings. But then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave Sulaiman Ali Salam even more. Right? The kind of kingdom he gave him was unparalleled, not given to anybody else. So some of those things are mentioned that he had, what is Sulaiman Ariha Asifa, that he had the wind at his disposal, he could take him wherever he wanted. Right? And likewise, Wamin al Shayateen, he had the shaitans working for him as well. Right? The jinns, the shaitans working for him. Then the discussion moves on to uh, Ayyub alayhi salam and the patience he had to go through because of the affliction that he had gone. This is the sabr of Ayyub alayhi salam that's very famous. But then Allah says, and you see with all of these, the discussion is, then we responded to them. Then we made them better. Then we gave them respite. Then we saved them. So, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ دُرْ We basically removed all of the sicknesses from him. Like, I mean, if you read the story of his sickness, you think he could never get better. But Allah made him much better than he was even before. That's why there's people who've got severe eczema problems or severe other bodily burns or whatever. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then speaking about Idris, Ismail, Dhul Kifl. But all of these, they're, they're in brief then. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Dhul Noon, which is uh, uh, Yunus alayhi salam. And then the famous dua of his is mentioned here. Uh, he calls out in the darkness, La ilaha illa ant. Now think about it. There is no God except you. Subhanak, you are purified, you are glorified. I was of the oppressors. That is a powerful dua. Includes tawheed in there, includes uh, a, uh, uh, a declaration of the oneness of Allah, declaration of his transcendence, and then declaration of a person's wrongdoing. Fastajabnala. Again, we responded to him and we took him out of this grief. Wakadalika nunjil mu'minin. And this is the lesson for us. This is the way we give delivery or success or safety to the believers. Then he talks about Zakaria alayhi salam, how we gave him basically an inheritor in the form of Yahya alayhi salam. Again, fastajabnala, we responded to him. All of this is about respond. Read, read this and you will find that if we're having trouble, one of these troubles will relate to us. Whether it's a sickness, whether it's a difficulty, whether it's something we really want and we're not getting, all of those examples are provided in here. Well worth reading them. So I said you have to keep coming back to these verses, subhanAllah. You have to keep coming back to these verses. Then there's the discussion of... Uh, وَالَّتِي أَحْسَنَ الثَّرْجَةَ فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهَا مَرْيَمْ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامِ إِنَّ هَذِي أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا Then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 94 maybe as a conclusion of all of that فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ This is all the prophets and anybody who does good basically whoever does any deeds of righteousness while he's a believer فَلَا كُفْرَانَ لِسَعِيهِ Right, there will be no denying of them. We will write them all down. They're all being recorded. 
Then finally the surah ends with a discussion, since in the last surah we had the discussion, Surah Al-Kahf, about Ya'juj, Ma'juj. Here there's a discussion of finally about the Ya'juj, Ma'juj as well. وَاقْتَرَبَ الْوَعْدُ الْحَقِّ فَإِذَا هِيَ شَاخِصَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكَنَّهُ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ They'll just be coming down from all heights. You'll just see them pouring down. So that discussion is uh, that, that uh, they, they alluded to then. And finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the very prominent verse here. Where he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can look at his verse 107. Just before the ending, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ إِنَّ فِي هَذَا لَبَلَاغًا لِقَوْمٍ عَابِدِينَ This is all con, you know, conveyed to the people who are worshippers. But you, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا I've only sent you as a mercy for all the worlds. Now you can translate world in whatever way you want. You can say world as in the different kingdoms of animals and uh, birds and things. You can talk about uh, this world, the next world. So, عَالَمِينَ is very general and you can basically categorize that in anything that can be categorized as an alam. But remember one thing that an alameen, plural of alam, literally what it just means is, alam means a sign. Anything which is a sign that Allah exists is an alam. That's everything. So everything besides Allah is an alam, literally speaking. Everything besides Allah is an alam because it shows that Allah exists and that He's the creator of that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Quran as well. And finally, the last point that's made here is قَالَ رَبِّحْكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ قَالَ رَبِّحْكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ What happened actually here is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, O oh my Lord, uh, make, the, make, make the true judgment now. Make the judgment with justice. وَرَبُّنَا الرَّحْمَانُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ And our Lord is the most merciful, Rahman. Al-Musta'anu ala ma tasifun. He is the one who can be sought for assistance against that which you describe. So this is a dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that ends the chapter of Surah uh, of Hajj. I think just the one verse I want to point out is verse 35 or 34 and 35. We've not made permanence for any, for any human being. We've not given permanence to. The famous verse, uh, the famous point in the Quran that every nafs, every soul is to taste death. But we're going to test you uh, with good and, good and bad as, as your fitna and as a test. In the world, you, you're confronted with good and bad. But to us, uh, you will eventually be, uh, you will ev you will eventually be uh, returning. And the other one that I wanted to point out is even before that, verse 22. We don't have time to go into it in depth, but basically this is a very important evidence of Allah's oneness. He says, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَ Had there been in the two, in the heavens and the earth, had there been multiplicity of gods, had there been more than one god, right? Then they would have both become, they would have both been in chaos. But we see that the earth and the heavens, they're not in chaos. Which basically the idea is that it's trying to invoke the idea that whenever you've got more than one person, uh, you know, or parties trying to take care of something, there's going to end up in chaos. Right? Like there's, you know, there's different things that too many co cooks spoil the broth. It's difficult to have two managers at the same level. Right? Two bosses at the same level. You know, partnerships are difficult. So... Uh, Allah is saying, just look at that in terms of the heavens and the earth, that when you look at the heavens and the earth, there's no chaos in there. So anyway, the, uh, as I was saying that this is something that um, is mentioned in the books of theology, uh, that if you look at it from that perspective, that everything is going in order. Yes, we've got greenhouse gas and ozone layer problems, and that's because human beings create a problem there. But from a control perspective, the, the earth and the, the heavens... Uh, MashaAllah in complete order So you can look at that for yourself Now let us move on to Suratul Hajj Now Suratul Hajj after this whole series of Makki, verse, Makki surahs or Meccan surahs Is a Madani surah 
Though it's a Madani Surah and it's got a bit of laws, but still it resembles a Makki Surah. It re resembles a Mad while it's a Madinan Surah and it should have more laws and things like that, it's still a lot of the theme in there, a lot of it actually you'll see, is actually very similar to a Makki Surah. Maybe that's why it's kept here uh, next door. So it's the 22nd Surah of the Quran. So we've done 22nd, 22 Surahs of the Quran and we're halfway through Juz 17. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم إن زلزلة الساعة شيء عظيم يوم ترونها تذهل كل مرضعة عما أرضعت وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارا وترى الناس سكارا وما هم بسكارا ولكن عذاب الله شديد. I had to read those because that's a very awesome beginning. It actually talks about the magnification of the, you can say the terror of the day of judgment. Basically saying that the tremor of the day of judgment is a mighty event indeed. The day when you will see it, it's a day when basically it's such a severe day that it is enough for pregnant women to basically miscarry. And you will see people as though they're in an intoxicated state, not knowing what to do. Generally people are in that state either if they're drunk or when they're not drunk, then the only way is when they're totally bewildered. When they have no idea what they, what they must do because they just can't make sense of what's going outside. It's just that they've lost their mind. Allah protect us on this day. Allah give us thabat on this day. Allah give us understanding on this day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to remain, uh, uh, re remain with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. So that's how it begins. And I'll let you read that and appreciate that yourself. But Surah Al-Hajj is a Madani Surah as I mentioned. It has 78 verses. It has 78 verses. And it has about 10, it's in 10 sections or so on. Allahu Akbar. The reason why it's called Surah Al-Hajj, even though you've got Hajj Masail mentioned earlier before as well, in other surahs, uh, this is more about the inception of Hajj, this is more about the emotional response to Hajj, the feelings that one needs to have for Hajj that Muslims generally have and why they have them. So it starts off with a discussion about Ibrahim alayhi salam. I mean the surah doesn't start off but the discussion on Hajj starts off which we'll see. Uh, uh, with Ibrahim alayhi salam and his, his construction of the Kaaba and then basically him calling out so we will inshallah get to that point as I mentioned there are uh, some rulings mentioned in here but the majority of it is still evidences of uh, the tenets of faith so one really really important verse in here right, which makes a person think about the human um, uh, the human being from an embryonic stage to the end and just talks about the elaborate nature of that so this is verse 5 ya ayyuhan nasu in kuntum fi raybin min al ba'th this is generally mentioned as a response to the uh, to, to the disbelief of resurrection right the how can a person be resurrected again so allah says we created you Firstly from soil, that's Adam alayhi salam. Your initial inception is from soil. Then after that you're from the fluid. Then you become a clot of blood. Then after that it's a piece of flesh. All of this, we want to make it very clear to you that this is all stage by stage. If we can do this very subtle, elaborate, sophisticated uh, creation of you, then you know, then we leave you basically in the uh, in an embryonic stage in the wombs for as long as we wish. Then after that we take you out as a child. Then after that you reach your age of strength. Then some among you, you tawaffa, die, are taken, their, their time is fulfilled. And some of you actually do not die early enough. They actually re return to ardhalil umur. That's evil old age, decrepitude, uh, senility. And basically, this is a dua that we need to make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-haram. Or Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min, min an uradda ila ardha lil umur. Say ameen. Say ameen. Because it means, oh Allah, I seek your refuge from evil old age. 
or I seek your evil, uh, I seek your uh, refuge from being returned to the, this lowly life. So that they end up not knowing anything after knowing. It's like a person gets back to childhood almost. Not everybody gets to that stage. Some people, mashallah, at their peak they die. Or some people with all the strength of their mind they pass away. May Allah never, never allow us to go to this stage of evil old age. If Allah keeps us long, inshallah, with iman, allow us to be fresh and, and have our, uh, our organs and everything intact, especially our brain and our heart to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is mentioned in detail as a response that if Allah takes it through all of these complicated steps, then what's the thing about creating another being? Uh, sorry, or resurrecting you afterwards, especially when, uh, you know, now we know that we even have DNA. It's all fixed in every part of the human body mostly. So, and then the hadith mentions that, you know, even if you get mauled by an animal, even if you get totally decomposed, there's always a part which is going to remain, a particle. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the day of judgment and a number of arguments about that and people, their responses and everything like that. So, Allahu Akbar, the day of judgment is discussed in quite a bit as well. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, discusses if you look at verses 8 to 10, that is all an argument about the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَيْسَ بِظَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in the least, not at all in any way, going to oppress his servants. Whatever you've done, you will get it. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ Now this verse, number 11, is interesting because it is talking about those people and may Allah not make us of them because... Subhanallah, you know, sometimes we can find some similarities here. Among people are those who worship Allah, ala harf, kind of on the side. Right? That's kind of the gist of that. What that means is they're kind of half-heartedly worshiping, uh, worshiping Allah. When goodness comes to them, then they're running to the masjid and they're satisfied. So then they, they, they do shukr to Allah, they make thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They may make a prayer, they may give sadaqah or whatever. But, وَإِنَ صَابَةُ fitna. If they get a challenge in their life where it's not all going rosy, in qalaba ala wajhi, they basically turn on their faces. Right? So they're not doing the good thing. Khasira dunya wal akhirah. These people, their dunya and akhirah is all spoilt. Dharik al khusan, may Allah not make us of them. He's saying, Yad'u min dunillahi ma la yadurruhu wa malayin. They call on to, besides Allah, they call on to those things which can't benefit them or harm them. What a, what a extreme. Deviance that is. Then in verse 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the various different major theological uh, beliefs that were prevalent at the time. And then speaks about which one is the successful one. So if you look at verse 7, he says, In the ladina amanu wa ladina had wa sabi'een. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the people who believe, the Yahud. Then he speaks about the sabi'een. The Sabites, I think that's what you call or Sabians, right? I'll, I'll explain them. Speaks about the Nasara, which means the Nazarenes, the Christians. Speaks about the Magians. And then he speaks about the Ashraku. He basically speaks about the pagans. In Allah yafsilu baynahum yawm al qiyamah. Now, every other belief generally comes within something like this, right? Whether that be in, in some sense or the other. The, the Sabians, they were, a ta the, the sab uh, the, they were a people at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam that used to worship the stars. So, in Allah yafsilu baynahum yawm al qiyam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it very clear and will decide between them on the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a witness to everything. The next verse is a sajda verse where you have to do a sajda. I think it's, that's, I think the sixth sajda verse, I think that is, right? Then let's move forward to verse 26. That is when the Hajj discussion begins. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, where he, the, the, the place where the house is going to be built. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to purify the place and so on uh, for the people who are going to come and prostrate and uh, bow down in, uh, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him the famous verse that we hear every Hajj time. Verse 27 is beautiful. 
وعلى كل ضامر يأتين من كل فج عميق ليشهدوا منافع لهم ويذكروا اسم الله في أيام معلومات على ما رزقهم على ما رزقهم من بهيمة الأنعام فكلوا منها وأطعموا البائس الفقير so there's not many laws mentioned here. It's more about the, the, your approach to the Hajj. So Allah says, "Wa adzin fi nasi bil Hajj." Go and announce. Uh, he was told to actually. He went to the Jabal Abu Qubais, which is basically the the small mount just next to the Haram on which the uh, the current palaces are. Right? You can see that there's a bit of a. You can see it from some directions. That is called Jabal Abu Qubais, uh, and then you've got Jabal Khandama behind it, the larger one. So anyway, the idea is that he went there and he then proclaimed. He says, nobody's going to hear me. If you look at Ibn Kathir, he says, nobody's going to hear me. He says, your job is to just proclaim. He proclaimed about the Hajj and then subhanallah, until today, there are people who subliminally this message gets to them and they want to go there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take that. May Allah open up the Hajj this year because obviously it's all under in limbo right now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove this waba from us so that we can actually go for a Hajj insha'Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَٰلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ ذَٰلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ حُرُمَاتِ اللَّهِ ذَٰلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ حُرُمَاتِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ Everything that Allah has sanctified, those who revere it, that's actually good for them. Then Allah mentions later again, ذَٰلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ The salient the salient features that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put there, whoever respects them and honors them and venerates them, then that is good for them as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 35 mentions, a these are the good parts, these are the, what we should really listen to because this is a direct message to us of how we should be. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about <clears throat> the believers, uh, what their description should be. May Allah make us of them. الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَبَشَّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Those who when they remember Allah, their hearts tremble. وَالصَّابِرِينَ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَهُمْ So when they remember Allah, when Allah is mentioned, they're so connected that they think. You know, every time, if you're told about your beloved, right? If you're told about your beloved, it's going to bring about an emotion in you. So the idea is that Allah should be so close to you that whenever Allah is mentioned, that emotion just wells up in you. If it doesn't, then it means that your love isn't enough. Because the, that's a sign of love, that when your mahboob, your beloved is mentioned, your heart wells up. Right? There's some emotion that comes, that, 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 there's an outpouring of, of some emotion there. So may Allah allow us to do that. وَالصَّابِرِينَ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَهُمْ And any affliction that comes to them, they're patient. So patience is always going to be an issue. Remember this for all those places which are, if you're listening from those places where there are difficulties, there are difficulties everywhere in the world, some places just worse than others. Allah tells you that you have to make sabr because that is what a believer is. And Allah says, وَبَشِّرْ Give glad tidings to such people. So if you have to be patient, عَلَى مَا أَصَابَهُمْ But the other thing is that these people are all مُقِيمِ مُقِيمِ الصَّلَاةِ They establish the prayer. There's always a discussion of the prayer. Brothers and sisters out there who are listening, right? If it's only in Ramadan that you're regular on your prayers and you don't think it's a big issue to miss a few prayers here and there. I'm preaching right now. Because this is such an important, you've seen, if you've been with us on this journey of tafsir, you've seen that wherever sabr is mentioned, wherever success is mentioned, glad tidings are mentioned, there is always glad tidings, those people are always praying. Right? They always establish the prayers. Do not mess with your prayers. Make a firm, firm commitment in this Ramadan, right in fact now, that any prayers that I've even missed, forget about in the future, but those I've missed, I'm going to make them up. Alhamdulillah, friend, just... Uh, spoke to me just a week ago or something he had about seven years of prayers to make up from in you know, the past times and he's nearly finished them right that's a huge hope that gives a huge hope to a lot of people who have got lots of missed prayers and the fourth thing that they do is they spend of that which we have provided them so let us spend in the path of Allah establish our prayers be patient when the need arises and develop such love and connection with Allah that our heart always feels an emotion when Allah is mentioned in any way. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 37, just two verses afterwards, 
Now, speaking about the whole qurbani and everything aspect, well, budn, right? These are, these are the qurbani animals, right, that they do in hajj. Allah says that, look, all of this qurbani that's done, all of these animals that are sacrificed at that time, we don't want your meat. You eat the meat. That's why it's halal to eat the meat of qurbani, right? It is not the meat we want. It is not the blood that we want. وَلَكِنْ يَنَالُهُ التَّقْوَى مِنْكُمْ what reaches Allah is the taqwa and the righteousness, the emotion that you have when you're doing your qurbani. What is the state of your heart? And that's the secret of hajj. What is the state of your heart in hajj? Because a lot of people do hajj. And it's like, okay, I've done my seven rounds. Then I've gone and had my zamzam, alhamdulillah. I've done then the seven safa marwas. Khalas. You didn't feel anything in that. Then you didn't really get much. You've absolved your obligation. But really what the hajj is all about is the feeling that should come about because you're in the house of Allah, right? Because generally when you're in salat, you're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at home. When you're fasting, it brings you even closer to Allah. You feel closer to Allah. Now there's some people Allah wants to reward by taking them to his house. So that's why it's like I've gone to the house of my beloved. Now if, you can't, if we can't get muster that kind of an idea, that emotion, that belief, that sentiment, then we lose the whole spirit of the hajj. And that's why Allah uh, in this verse clarifies that. Now the last section of this, the last quarter of this is going into the masail now finally. So after speaking about the manasik, the rights of hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives now for the first time permission for, for jihad and qital, right? To the, the, the Muslims of Makkah, because until now they'd been prohibited from doing so. And their, their whole, uh, the, the whole thing until now was be, be patient and uh, be forgiving and be pardoning. Let it go. They didn't have the strength to strike back, the, uh, you know, except where they had to be defense uh, and, and so on. They just, uh, until now, they had no ability to fight, right? However, once they became fully established uh, and the evil and the plots against them continued and in fact increased, right? Then finally, as you see in verse 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ They've finally been given permission, right? Allah finally gives them permission in this verse because they've been oppressed. Because they've been oppressed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has absolute capability to assist them and give them victory. And then Allah mentions the reasoning of why they're allowed to fight. Because fighting is not good. Fighting, you're killing people. And Allah's been prohibiting from murdering people, prohibiting from spilling blood. So why is this then allowed? So Allah says, min haq. These people are allowed, they've been given permission because they've been forced out of their homes without any right. Right? Just only because they said, Rabbun Allah, our Lord is Allah. Look at what happened to the Rohingyas. Look at what they're trying to do in the Indian subcontinent or in India. Right? And then Allah provides the wisdom. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not, basically, you can say, straighten the scale, straighten the balance by allowing some people to kill others like this, then the evil people would overcome everyone. And then after that, the, the, they would not let you worship Allah. That's why it's saying the various different places of worship, not just Muslim places of worship, but sawami, biya, salawat and the masajid, the various temples and synagogues and everything would be destroyed. Because the whole materialism and all of that would take over. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name has been mentioned. All of that would have been destroyed throughout the ages of the different prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist those who assist him. Meaning those who try, Allah will assist them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is powerful and he's mighty. And then Allah again mentions that those, that if we give them place in the earth, then they will establish prayer, they will give zakat, and they will do amr wil ma'roof and nahi al munka. They will enjoin the good and prohibit the evil. And for Allah is basically the ending of all matters. So all of that discussion is, discussion is there. And <clears throat> so as I said, this was the first time they'd been given permission now to fight back properly. Now let's move on, verse 49. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to declare to the people his position. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّمَا أَنَا لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ Say, O oh people, I am just a clear warner to you. That's what I've come here because what's going to happen the, in terms of the hereafter and so on is a very important matter that you need, you need to be concerned about. Then after that, there's 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this is an interesting verse which is verse 52 وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ Every prophet and messenger that we sent before when they would uh, when we would inspire something to them and when they would relate it shaitan would actually create corruption in the understanding of that in the minds of people so when they're listening to the quran or they're listening to any of the scriptures shaitan would try to mislead them in the understanding of it right there's a huge discussion on this and some people have actually made mistakes in their interpretation even jalalain has a bit of an issue when it when it discusses this piece when it discusses this verse but then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always abrogates that which that in that that which shaitan that corruption which shaitan inspires and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes firm his ayat his verses and allah is knowing now the reasoning that this happened where allah has even allowed this to happen where shaitan can kind of uh, is to differentiate the good from the bad differentiate the people who are willing to be pure and make the effort to get the correct understanding so that's that's the idea here that's the idea here and that's why the one thing that we're told before reading quran is that we read a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim we do not want the shaitan to be manipulating our understanding and coloring our understanding of the quran because it's easy for that to happen if we don't seek protection from the shaitan that's why we say I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan the accursed. That's why we read it before the Quran. You see a lot of people, they stand up to speak. They say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. That's not really the place for A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billah is more for if you're going to read Quran. Right? Otherwise, Bismillah suffices in every... Of course, you can seek protection from shaitan wherever you want to. And subhanAllah, people trying to manipulate the words of Allah. This is a perennial problem. It's a historical problem and it's happening today. Today, you basically see, I mean, the BBC has been going on forever and that Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset. I mean, there's Muslims working for them. They take interview of Muslims. They, they've, they've got these Ramadan, seri you know, these Ramadan diaries of Muslims and so on. Why they keep saying sunrise to sunset, I have no idea. It could be a genuine mistake, but until now, they haven't corrected it. And nobody's pointed it out. I don't know. Wallahu alam. Right, but year in and year, year in year out, that's that's the discussion. But then we have so many. I mean, that's that's light. The bigger issues that we're talking about is that there's constant manipulation of what the Quran is really saying, to try to deny, for example, hijab, deny the importance of prayer, deny the importance of many many aspects that we've been reading in the Quran. Right? People can manipulate it because most people aren't scholars of the Quran. So that's why always a'udhu billahi min shaitanir rajim it's important because this is all shaitani. Finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a number of other proofs of uh, his qudra his ability his awesome power and so on and re and and uh, rejects a lot of the uh, the, the uh, basically their idols and their other objects of worship and so on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages uh, salat again and zakat and so on and so forth and by that he ends the surah uh, there's not many other verses that i want to highlight i think i've discussed everything here just the last verse i want to discuss yes the last verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is the way he ends it <clears throat> he says فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ establish the prayer give zakat and hold fast unto allah he is your he is your patron he is the one who can do your, your he is the one who can do whatever you need this is that sister formula to hasbun allahu wa ni'mal wakil mawla wa ni'mal nasir so he comes separately here ni'mal mawla what a wonderful patron he is wa ni'mal nasir and what a wonderful helper is he that, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah be our helper. And by this we end, alhamdulillah, the 17th juz. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us. Let us just do a quick recap uh, of the main points. Surah Al-Anbiya is the first surah that we read of Surah Al, uh, of the 17th juz. It starts off uh, about the resurrection, about the day of judgment being close and people being uh, distracted and so on. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told us that Allah is revealing the Quran as a story about you. This is the story of you. 
لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Aren't you going to understand it? That's verse 10. Then there's discussions about Tawheed and uh, that all the prophets had the same call. And then there's a very rational arguments provided through the cosmic uh, perceptible uh, phenomena outside with regards to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then verse 46, which I didn't point out is, وَلَئِن مَسَّتْهُمْ نَفْحَةٌ مِّنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّكَ If just the whiff of a punishment from your Lord comes to them, you would say, يَا وَيْلَنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ Woe be to us or upon us, we were of the oppressors. They can't handle punishment. But then they, they, they're willing to risk it all the time. Then the story of uh, Ibrahim salam and his destroying all the idols and so on. And his strength in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even at that young age. And then numerous other stories of the prophets that we saw and the benefits from that. Then we begin Surah Al-Hajj. And in that it starts off with this uh, really graphic uh, and terrifying depiction of the Day of Judgment. And then after that the discussion of approving resurrection and through the, cre the, the various different stages of the creation of the human being. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides a discussion about the obligation of hajj and the sentiments regarding hajj and the rights of hajj uh, and the various different other prominent points about that. Then how uh, taking, uh, for, where, where the muhajireen etc. were forced out of their houses. We didn't really cover those verses too much, but then that's when they were finally given the permission of jihad and so on. <clears throat> and then uh, the, the end uh, we end with the importance of salat and <clears throat> establishing the obligations and holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those true believers and al allow us to continue this journey, to complete it and then beyond to be more detailed and allow the Quran to infuse our hearts, our souls, our lives and be illuminating for us inshaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. May Allah bless your Ramadans as well. Please, please keep us all in your du'as. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this Ramadan better than any Ramadan uh, before it for us. Wa akhirud da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.